Hey guys, Justin Ledford here and welcome to the Real Construction Owners Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing the importance as a contractor of investing in real estate as well as how to be financially literate for contractors with Carlos Rivera. Whether you want to learn how to win $100,000 contracts or $3 million government construction contracts, the course that I've created for you will give you the exact blueprints you need to succeed as a government contractor. It's a self-paced university, so you can complete all of it on the comfort of your home. It includes 33 lectures, a 30-day challenge for you to win a minimum of $200,000 in contracts, and a comprehensive digital manual, and exclusive access to a private online university. If you're interested, I'll leave a link down below. We'd love to have you join us. And now let's go ahead and begin investment real estate, and financial literacy for contractors, featuring Carlos Rivera. Welcome to the Real Construction Owners Podcast, where we interview real construction owners, investors, and people just crushing it in their field. Today, we have Carlos Rivera, the owner of Rivera Realty. He specializes in commercial purchases and renovations, and value adds. So if you're a contractor who is looking to buy a building or add value to your building, you're going to want to pay close attention. Stay tuned. What's up, Carlos? How you doing today, buddy? How's it going, Justin? Thanks for having me. Man, I'm doing great. Just out here in Central America. How, where are you at right now? Miami, Florida. Yeah, buddy. This city that never sleeps. Yeah, I think that's New York City, but yeah, Miami definitely doesn't sleep either. So, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, every time I've ever been, I'm like, oh my God, these people put some clothes on. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nudists. That's what we are. We like to be nudists. Uh, right on. <laughs> hey, man, I walk around nude in my backyard here in Costa Rica, but I can do that. So, <laughs> uh, seriously, though. No, I'm just joking. Hey, Carla, so ta tell us the story. Before we get into what you do, specialize in and how it can benefit contractors, tell us your story. You know, what were you doing before you got into commercial acquisitions? Yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, okay, so I started off in the tech industry. Uh, I was working at Yahoo, old internet company, a software engineer. Um, and, you know, uh, exactly like what's happening now in the tech industry, there was a there was a big kind of layoff season. This is back in 2008, um, right when I got into the workforce. And, uh, you know, huge layoff occurred in, in my office. And I was one of the few that, that stayed behind that didn't get fired. And it was, it was a little bit of kind of an eye opening experience, a, a reality check, if you will. And that sort of led me down the rabbit hole of learning about business, real estate. I, I discovered the, the concept of, of owning rental properties that would, uh, you know, pay you, pay you incomes, even, even if you work or not. Right. So basically the freedom that owning uh, income producing property provides. So bought a duplex as my first property, then bought another duplex, and little by little the the portfolio grew. Um, and you know eventually you you sort of graduate to larger properties if you continue to kind of snowball the 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 acquisition process. And, and today we're acquiring commercial properties. Started a, a small little syndication business with a, with a partner in Kansas City, Missouri. We buy uh, distressed value add uh, commercial properties we've done some office buildings and um, and some retail centers in, in the Kansas City Missouri and Kansas City Kansas market a lot of people don't know that the city of Kansas City is actually half in Kansas and half in Missouri so yeah we're in that market we're uh, we, you know we're always looking for new deals always we always have a bunch of projects going on happy to jump into any any specifics that you would like uh, to do but yeah that's what we're that's what we're doing now and we're we're chugging along and still in the game hoping to remain in the game, even though the uh, economy's kind of taken a little bit of a turn. Oh, but curious. Yeah. How, ma how many how many uh, acquisitions or properties you currently hold in the portfolio? Uh, we got about 200 units under management in the property management company. So Rovira Realty is a property management leg of the, the business. And then we have another company called RG Capital Partners that is the acquisition side. Uh, within, within the actual RG Capital Partners portfolio, we've got three commercial buildings, two of which are office buildings in uh, Independence, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City. And then we have a retail, uh, kind of like a little like a little strip mall slash office building on the Kansas side in a little town called Shawnee, Kansas, right outside of, uh, of the main Kansas City, uh, Kansas area. Those are the, the, the buildings we've syndicated. They were like extreme value add, 
properties, one of which was completely, one of the office buildings was completely vacant and essentially overrun by you know, homeless people and crackheads. We got in there, we bought it for real cheap, we vacated it, we fixed it up. And now we're like, I think last time I checked, we were at about 50% occupancy in a couple of months. So nice. uh, we're hoping to get that to as, as close to 100% as possible and then just cash out, refinance and move on to the next deal. I love that. I love that. See, as an investor myself, you and I know each other because we're both a part of the incredible GoBundance. If you're not a part of GoBundance, list contractors, listen in. It's for, if you want to learn how to increase your passive income, you want to learn how to increase your net worth and be around the epic dudes, then you should check it out. Go to GoBundance.com, mention I sent you. And with that being said, you know, they, a lot of contractors make good money, but they don't necessarily invest it. They buy the big truck and the big boat the Rolex and, you know, blow it at the clubs or whatever. You, you're talking about value add. If you could talk to our contractor who's renting a building right now and wants to buy a building and they're hearing value add, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to first make the distinction between income and net worth, right? I mean, just because you have high income doesn't mean you're wealthy, right? Because if you've got high income and you're spending all your income, then you're really not wealthy. Um, you're just living paycheck to paycheck. But if you can somehow find a way to, to parlay that income as a contractor or as a construction company owner into acquiring as many assets that produce income as possible, that's how you can really sort of break free of the uh, of the you know the the trap that is having a job or being a, a, just a business owner. Uh, so you know, going back to the the question you asked about the the construction owner owning a building, I mean, yeah, if you're renting. If you rent the building, you're basically throwing away money in rent. But if you own the building, uh, you're you're presumably going to have a mortgage on that building. But that mortgage, even though you're making payments like you would be making a rental payment, you're paying down you know the debt, which is then increasing the equity you have in that building as the owner, and therefore your net worth is actually increasing every time you make a payment. Whereas if you were just paying rent, that's just money that go, goes out the door, not really helping you. Uh, so in that specific scenario, yeah, owning owning the building if you can carry it. Uh, if, you, if you're able to carry it, is far more powerful from a wealth building perspective than just renting it and using it as a means to to generate a high income on the construction or on the business side. You, you got to have a healthy balance of both. You know, a lot of contractors, they're, they're hearing this and they're like, okay, well, what do I do? Well, you're already spending the money on the rent. Might as well buy the building. I mean, I started buying a build, I bought a building in Houston. And now I outgrew that. I have a tenant paying for it and it's my asset, you know, worth several hundred grand. Now we have one in Austin and we fixed it up and did a value add. And that's what I want to ask you, Carlos, for our listeners who they're curious, like, what is a value add? What are all the benefits of that? What, how do I cash out refinance? Could you share some insights on that? Yes. Okay. So let's look at the simple example of a house, right? A single family home. A single family home is only worth as much as the house next door sold for, right? So when you go to purchase a home, you do an appraisal, um, an appraiser is going to come and look at what's sold in the neighborhood and based on the square footage and the size and the quality of the home is going to come up with a value and say, okay, your house house is worth this much. Uh, on the flip side of that, commercial property, on the other hand, is worth based on the income it produces. So it the, the value of the building is a function of the income it produces. So if you purchase a building that's making $100,000 a year, it's going to be worth a lot less than a building that's making, let's say, two hundred grand a year, right? So the, the the value of that building is a function of its income. So on the value add side, if you can get yourself into a building that is not producing to its fullest potential, a good example of that is like something that has a very high vacancy, right? So like we we bought a building that was I think sixty percent vacant or sixty percent occupied, so forty percent of it was vacant. Uh, we purchased it based on the income it was generating. Uh, with the 60% occupancy only, that gave us a value. We purchased it based on that value. And now by filling that 40% that was empty, we've added income to the uh, bottom line and therefore have forced the value of that property to go up just by making it perform better than it otherwise was doing. Uh, that is value add. Value add is when you take something that's underperforming, improve upon it to make it perform even better. And therefore you're literally adding value to the, the, the asset by making it perform better. So that's pretty, that's, that's one aspect of value adds. 
the, another aspect of value add is buying the asset. It's old, it's dilapidated, it's fallen apart, it's distressed, it's got crackheads in it, there's, you know, the walls are stained. And then you come in and you fix it up. How, how are you able to do those types of value adds when it comes to increasing or when you're doing the takeout of the refinance? Got any stories? Uh, you got any successful stories that could shine some light to our contractors? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, if you improve upon a building, in theory, you could ask for more rent, right? I mean, if you if you purchase something that is old, 1970s, you know, shag carpet with, you know, dark interior or wood paneling, you're, you're probably not going to be able to command as high rent as something that is brand new and has been renovated. So if you can find yourself in a situation where you can purchase some sort of building that is that is outdated and not being used to its fullest potential and fix it up, you know, modernize it, um, add, you know, add, add value in modernization, then you can turn around and actually, you know, increase the rent. Um, and you'll probably have a lot more demand for that sort of product than, you know, the old shag carpet style. Uh, so yes, it, by renovating a property that goes hand in hand with making it perform better, because if you have something that's brand new, that's been fixed up, then in theory, it's worth more and people will be willing to pay more for it. So, you know, I've never done that. I've, I've always bought just like a single building just from my company, bigger and bigger every time I purchase and it's old, it's nasty. And then I fix it up. And then when, you know, a year or two later, when I'm ready to get something bigger, I refinance it for more than I paid for it because it's worth more because I added value to it. But you're making me think, okay, maybe I should go buy a bigger building with several offices host just my my business in one office and then collect rent on all the other offices that's what you're making me think building hack man just like the house hacking you know you buy a duplex you live on one side you rent out the other uh you know you can building hack you put your building you put your your business in one unit and you rent out the rest basically the building pays for itself you have free rent essentially um and you've added value there you've built you've continued to build your wealth you know, while also helping your business continue operating, have a place to, to operate from. That's interesting. Okay, cool. So now tell us a story about uh, an expensive lesson, something that cost you stress, cost you money, cost you pain, regret, but from it came a valuable lesson. Yeah. Okay. So we bought this building um, that had a really old, HVAC uh, with like what what I I didn't know what this was until we purchased the building, but it has what's called a cooling tower. I I can't even explain it to you, but basically what it does it's it's a giant tank that's on the top of the it's on the roof that's filled with water, and that water gets used to somehow generate the cooling of the air or the heating of the air uh, through the HVAC system. We didn't do a very good job of of inspecting the uh the hvac system we were just frankly we were inexperienced and you know that building has been just constant a, a constant expense or capital expense i mean we, we've had compressors fail we've had multiple uh ac or hvac companies tell us that the cooling tower is about to to die and that's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar expense uh so w we've basically sort of put the building or the, the HVA system on kind of like a life support, like a maintenance, like let's try to just kick the can down the line as much as possible, make the HVAC work. We've done some modernization. So we've added controls uh, to the to the building, which helps regulate the uh, the usage of the compressor. So it doesn't put as much strain on the on the system. Therefore, hopefully it'll, it will last longer. And that's that was an eighty thousand uh, dollar upgrade right there, uh, which would have been nice if we had known we were going to have to do that. Thankfully, we were in a, in a good place capital-wise. We had raised enough money uh, to deal with, with those sorts of things. Um, and then we also got lucky. We had a, a roof. When I say lucky, we were unlucky and then ended up being lucky. We had a, a big roof leak uh, one day that caused a lot of water to uh, to get into the building. And uh, we, we had a real nice insurance claim uh, that yes. you know, helped us quite a bit. Uh, and... and it affected the HVAC, so we got lucky, and you know, an act of God came and sort of messed up the HVAC. So we were able to use some of that money to fix up some of the things we needed to do. But yeah, man, it was just a, just kind of an expensive and very kind of you know anxiety ridden 
uh, experience. Now we know we're looking actually at another building now that has like pretty much the same uh, HVAC system. And now we know exactly what to look for. We know exactly how much the budget, uh, you know, to w what will need to be fixed. And, you know, it was an expensive lesson, but you know, now we came out of it wiser and, and more, uh, more clear, more enlightened in that regard. So. Well, it's interesting. You brought all this up because, you know, I own flagstone roofing and exteriors and we specialize in insurance claims. That's all I do. We've done thousands of claims, eight figures worth of insurance payouts. So I'd love to be your guy. You know, if you ever need me to come out and inspect your properties, we per per perform a very digital investigation and we know how to get those insurance companies to buy you a new roof, new AC unit, all that good stuff. But you have to have the policy for so long. I'm sure you know how it works. Yeah. It's a scam. All right. It's a scam. Insurance is a scam. <laughs> well, you got to use it. You got to use it. So it's true. Less time. That was good for you. It's, it's a vicious cycle, right? Like you, you get jaded by the insurance company. So then when the time comes to, to file a claim and you take advantage of them, it's, it's a never ending cycle. Right. Right. So good with the bad. So with that being yeah. said, what would you say is a process that's helped your business grow? And how it could be applicable to a contractor or an owner of a construction firm? Yeah, I think with any business, systems is everything. As you grow, you need to just implement systems and processes to to make things more efficient. Uh, you either use, I mean, there's there's the leverage of people's time and then the leverage of systems and a healthy balance of, of both. As you grow, you just need to make the right hires, hire the right people to sort of support the business. You know as a as a business owner and as a startup you're sort of used to doing everything yourself uh, and you realize that as you grow it becomes a lot less practical for you to do everything yourself in fact when you start doing everything yourself that you're actually hindering further growth so it's it's a matter of kind of identifying when you reach those points and deciding whether to put a person into that you know role another person other than yourself or a system you know whether it's a piece of software or some sort of process to make things, you know, move more easily. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question. I was probably just more broad than you expected, but yeah, you either people or, or people or process basically, or both. Um, and that goes for any business as you scale, you just need to be really, really diligent about, about implementing the right, the right systems to make it easier for you to, to, to move forward, not get, not get stuck. So. With that being said, you know, we can tell that you know what you're talking about when it comes to syndications, buy-in buildings. Talk to our audience about uh, the syndication offers that you have now or coming up and how you're always seeking uh, the right people to be a part of those deals. Yeah, I mean, we're always looking for deals. Uh, it's kind of hard now with interest rates going up. The uh, There's a little bit of kind of like a stalemate situation going on where, where sellers are kind of stubborn and they don't want to come down in price and buyers just can't can't buy because it's so expensive to, to finance properties. So I don't really have anything going on right now. Uh, we're always looking, always looking. We're always making offers, but we're very strict on our criteria. We only make offers that make sense and that we know we can't lose with. Um, and that's in this market, it's just been been very difficult. But yeah, we you know we 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 definitely are always open to to partnering with with anybody who may have uh, you know like-mindedness with us and, and, and would like to sort of, you know, do the same type of things that we're doing the, in the Kansas city market. That's the market that we're in. And yeah, I mean, we got the three buildings. We're, we're actively searching for anything that is, you know, retail, uh, strip centers, really the strip centers are, are kind of what our favorite because they're easier than office. Office is a little bit of a, of a management headache, but we'll take office buildings as well. Uh, value add is what we look for. Anything that is just badly managed uh, or or just you know underutilized. We specialize in management. We're we're an, we're an amazing uh, property management company. We're very very uh, very relentless. We're great at leasing. Leasing is a is an issue in in office. It's just hard to lease office. So we're really good at leasing. We're very fast at reacting to to things, and we're we're great at managing. So you know we'll take any any problem off of your hands. If you're a property owner and you're just kind of sick and tired of, of running your building and you just want to get rid of it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it because we're, we're well equipped enough to be able to manage pretty much anything nowadays. So what, what resources would you say you plugged into to learn how to acquire these commercial buildings and, and do the, do what you're doing? I read a lot. 
Uh, I'm always reading. My my, mom, my my wife says I need a book budget because I'm constantly spending money on on books to uh, to read up on on things. Uh, podcasts, man. If you can just listen to as many podcasts as you as you can on, on whatever subject you're trying to you know you're trying to trying to master. There's a million podcasts, real estate podcasts out there. Uh, community is important. I mean, you mentioned GoBundance. You know, if you can get yourself into some sort of mastermind group or a group of like-minded people that are doing the same thing you're doing, you know, that that compounding effect of just being around, you know, people who who can sort of you know uplift you and help you out when you're when you're struggling, you know, that is a game has been a game changer for me at least. Um, and that's pretty much it. Just, you're always learning. You're always, you're always trying to improve constantly. You never, you never know everything, right? You're, there's always something new to learn and something new to experience. So as long as you're open to that, uh, you know, you'll always be in a good, in a good position. Are these, uh, triple net leases? We, it, it so it, no, the ones we have are not triple net. Actually we purchased the, the offices are full service, which is why I mentioned earlier that it's harder to, to manage because you are managing the cleaning staff and all the kind of services that go along with, with, uh, with, uh, with, you know, operating the building, uh, the retail center, we bought it. It was, it was in such distress that the, they had triple net leases in place, but the owner wasn't collecting the, any of like the triple net charges. He was only collecting base rent. So we got in there and we started charging triple net, you know, the cam and all the, and the taxes, and the insurance to the, uh, to the tenant. And it was just like, you know, a mutiny was about to, was about to be, uh, you know, done on us for doing that but <laughs> we, we made a strategic decision after that to just convert them all to gross leases uh obviously at a higher rate to compensate for the the, the triple net uh because it's just, just so hard to explain to these little mom and pop operators that the, the strip center we have is small you know sub 2,000 square foot uh units so these mom and pop operators it's just, it's a lot harder to to explain to them what a triple net lease is and they want things to be a little bit more predictable uh, so it's, it's, it was just easier to convert everybody to gross. And, and then we just, so we just do gross and then we do a utility reimbursement and that, that's it. And that's been, that's been working for us. So, you know, on one of my podcasts, I had one of the bros uh, on boat and he's making a million dollars a month passively through his uh, triple net leases. So if you haven't already checked that episode out, because it's mind blowing the stuff that he says, you know, strategies that he's implementing as well. Now I'm curious what's next for you. More deals, man. You know, we want to do some more, uh, some more commercial properties. Uh, we ideally larger stuff. I mean, the stuff we've been doing has been in the million dollar range. Uh, and, yeah, I'd like to do something that's probably bigger than that. And, you know, I'll always be going bigger rather than going smaller. Uh, you know, if you can do a, a million dollar deal, you can do a $10 million deal. It's just the same amount of work, just, you know, just more money. So we'd like to kind of scale up and do some bigger deals. Uh, hopefully, you know, the market will, will, will turn in our favor sometime soon, or hopefully, you know, we'll just find something that, that works, but yeah, just go bigger, but focus on, on commercial value add deals. That's what we're good at. And that's what we're going to stick to for now. Carlos Rivera with Rivera Realty also doing syndications. If somebody wants to reach out to you, get on your email list and learn how they can be a part of future syndication deals, or if they've got a property to sell you, or if they need property management, how can they reach out to you? Uh, hit me up on Instagram. I tend to respond. It's the Carlos Rovira. Yes, I had to add the word the before my name because some somebody else took my name. So the Carlos Rovira, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I respond pretty quickly. So you can you can DM me through there, or just you know comment on something, and I'll and I'll try to try to hit you up. But I'm I'm very accessible. So Carlos, thank you for being on the Real Construction Owners Podcast today. We discussed. Uh, commercial syndications. We discuss value ads. We discuss at if you're a contractor and you haven't already purchased your building, what are you waiting for? With that being said, thanks for being on Real Construction Owners Podcast today, Carlos. Peace. Peace out. Drop me a comment down below and let me know how this was. And remember to hit that subscribe button if you're interested in growing your construction business faster and learning how to double your construction company using government construction contracts. I'll have that link below. I hope you can join me. Until next time, see you then.